In this week's update from IHME on the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the first thing to recognize is that there are really four zones of COVID transmission right now in the world. In the vast majority of countries, transmission continues to decline as countries come off the peaks of Omicron transmission. But uh, as there has been quite a bit of media attention, there is a secondary increase in transmission in some countries in Western Europe, most notably the United Kingdom, Ireland, France, Germany, uh, Greece are places where transmission is on the increase. And that increase is being attributed to the substitution of the BA2 variant for the BA1 variant combined with reduced mask use and social distancing. We don't think it's just BA2 because BA2 has actually been around for quite some time. In fact, for example, in South Africa, it appeared in December, it's replaced BA1, but there's been no substantial increase in community level transmission. We don't think, and you see this in our forecasts, that this combination of BA2 and reduced caution about transmission will lead to a prolonged secondary surge. And the reason is the surge in the Netherlands, uh, it went up, uh, came back up. The secondary surge, it's already peaked on its way down. Denmark, the BA1 and BA2 parts sort of coalesced into one, and that also came to an end reasonably quickly. And we think that'll be the pattern that we'll see in other countries of Western Europe. And it's possible that that pattern would spread to the United States and Canada as well. The third zone are those countries still in the sort of main upswing or, or peak levels of transmission due to a delayed Omicron wave. And those are mostly in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia are good examples of that. And then the biggest driver of uh, transmission cases potentially and deaths is what's playing out in the zero COVID strategy countries. So New Zealand looks to have um, hit their peak on Omicron, but it's coming down quite slowly. And then the big, big question is China, because we've seen that in an immunologically naive population with not good vaccination coverage in the elderly, quite a toll in Hong Kong. And now the question is when and if that will spread to mainland China. Uh, there are outbreaks in multiple cities, including Shanghai and Shenzhen and a number of other locations. And the Chinese government is still pursuing the strategy of lockdown for a short period and then multiple rounds of mass testing to identify all cases and then quarantine them. This worked in Beijing in February to stop transmission, and they are trying to pursue this uh, for now. But the economic consequences are very great, and there's greater calls within the Chinese leadership for less of a stringent policy. Our model foresees that that can't go on for that long. And so we have a huge peak with perhaps as many as a million deaths in China coming through in April, May, and into June. But the timing of that will depend critically on how the Chinese government chooses to either relax or not their zero COVID strategy. The other key issue that could mitigate the huge death toll that could be coming in China is the recent announcement of an IP waiver from Pfizer for Paxlovid for producers in 22 countries, including five producers in China. So there's an interesting strategic choice that will play out, which is the, the balance of the economic harm of the aggressive zero COVID strategy and creating time to produce antivirals uh, that would be sufficient to protect some of the unvaccinated elderly with, within China. And we'll clearly, the, the timing and, and how that plays out is, is going to be up to the, the policy choices in China. If we step back and, and zoom out more globally, there's still a, a, a tremendous amount of energy in trying to address vaccine inequality and addressing supply constraints, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa around vaccination. And that's certainly uh, well justified on moral grounds. Everybody should have access to uh, vaccination who wants it, but may not have a huge effect on death and hospitalization because we see in the data in Sub-Saharan Africa and other low-income countries, 
that cumulative infection rates are quite high. 80, 90% of most countries have already been infected. They have immunity from infection. And also vaccine hesitancy is quite high. So even if the supply constraints are addressed, which they should be on, on moral grounds, as I mentioned, we should not expect that to make a huge effect on this sort of six month time frame hospitalization and death rates. However, what we don't see is similar international energy on the crucial issue of access to antivirals, because antivirals like Paxlovid can reduce the death rate by 90%, and production capacity is small with the new IP waivers going to India and China and some other countries. Perhaps we can have a more concerted global effort at getting access to for everybody who needs it, particularly the elderly, to antivirals and that could really change the course of COVID over the next 12 months. Uh, and the other aspect of the antiviral scale up that is important to recognize is that we don't really know if current vaccines will do much for future variants. You know, vaccine effectiveness against Omicron, particularly transmission, has been quite low of the current vaccines. Whereas we suspect that the pathway that the antivirals use will stay preserved. Um, and so the antivirals would be an effective strategy irrespective of the type of variants that may come. And so uh, as we step out the, and go into this phase where it's very unlikely that we'll see um, you know, mandates and social distancing mandates as a main strategy for control, then it's really down to vaccination and antivirals, lots of push on anti-vaccination. We need equal policy attention and drive on, on the antivirals. Lastly, uh, of course, there is a real interest and attention on what might be the consequences on COVID uh, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, very difficult to assess because, of course, the, the information systems have fallen apart in the setting of um, the incredible uh, you know, uh, destruction and invasion that's underway. But one aspect of it that may mean that the effect of millions of refugees, crowding, lack of uh, opportunities to social distance may not be as bad as it might have been is that despite low vaccination rates in the Ukraine, they have very, as far as we can tell, very high levels of prior infection. So there is a quite substantial amount of immunity. Of course, there will be increased transmission. It'll be very, we probably won't get any data about it but hopefully the impact will be much less than if they had been a truly immunologically naive population.